Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, and thank you again for joining our workshops. Um, so just to introduce myself, uh, my name is Alex De La Cruz. I am a member of uh, Ryerson University, uh, part of the Ryerson Advanced Artificial Intelligence Laboratory and associated with IEEE Computer Intelligence uh, Society uh, for the Toronto sector. Uh, so in today's session of the first part of the five session workshops, we'll be covering just the introductory to Python, data science libraries, and PyTorch. Uh, so the agenda for today, we'll do a bit of introductions, uh, provide more background information with myself, uh, as well as we'll kind of, since there's a large group of participants, uh, we'll, divide, we'll split up into small little groups uh, so that uh, everyone can kind of introduce themselves within their own set of groups. Uh, we'll discuss some lear learning objectives for this session. Uh, then we'll dive into Python, some useful libraries, and a first look at PyTorch, as well as uh, uh, steps uh, potential steps beyond this workshop where if you're looking towards uh, configurations towards a local workstation. So a little bit about myself, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, my name is Alex De La Cruz. I'm currently a PhD student at Ryerson University, a graduate research assistant at Ryerson Advanced Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, uh, currently the Vice Chair for IEEE Signals and Computational Intelligence Chapter for the Toronto sector. Um, my research focus is in artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning, specifically in the area of healthcare and uh, under the supervision of Dr. Alariza Siddiqui at Ryerson University. Um, so with uh, that in mind, um, I'll go ahead and break up people into set break rooms uh, so you can kind of introduce yourselves amongst each other. This for today is we're going to look at the fundamental knowledge on Python to be able to model machine learning solutions, um, be able to access, set up uh, some available free computing platforms, and some basic understanding of Python data science packages. Uh, specifically, today we'll cover Panda and Scikit Learn. However, as we uh, as we join, uh, as we go towards uh, later workshops, uh, later sessions in the workshops, uh, we'll cover more packages as we go, get along to those specific topics. Uh, we'll also be looking at implementing a simple multi-layer perception um, in PyTorch and looking at how to link Kaggle resources to Colab and essentially um, meet new people uh, for potential uh, collaborations with, for data science and machine learning. So just an overview of what Python is. Python is uh, interpreted programming language. Uh, so the language is interpreted on runtime, does not need to be compiled. Um, it offers an interactive uh, session where uh, programs can be, uh, where uh, functions and uh, methods can be executed in an interactive environment. It's an object-oriented type of style. Uh, it's very good language for beginner. Uh, it's very easy to pick up.
Um, another other components that we'll look at is Jupyter Notebook, uh, specifically within, uh, specifically for Python. Uh, Jupyter, what it is, is it's an open source uh, platform. It's also interactive. It's a web application. And again, it's uh, very easy. Uh, it's good for uh, beginners. And the components within Jupyter Notebook that makes it beneficial is its capability to... Alex, um, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but yep. are you sharing your screen? Because we are not seeing any screen. Oh, sorry about that. No worries. Uh, thank you. Uh, so Perfect, yeah, now we can just, see it. Uh, yeah. uh, so just to backtrack again, sorry about that. Uh, so for the learning objectives, just to recap once more, um, uh, just to gain some fundamental knowledge of Python, uh, be able to access and set up available uh, some free computing platforms, uh, get some basic understandings of some packages, Panda and Psychic Learn, uh, uh, implement a simple multi-layer perceptron in PyTorch, as well as link resources to CoLab and essentially uh, meet like-minded people for collaborations. Uh, so again, Python is an interactive platform. It's interpreted, interactive, object-oriented, and a beginner language. Uh, there's another thing that will be also heavily utilized within this workshop is the Jupyter Notebook. Um, it's open source, uh, interactive web application, uh, also uh, very suitable for beginners. It provides uh, a documentation form that allows for code visualization, equations, as well as documented text. Um, so, uh, so for the resources components, there is what's available is a Google Colab. Uh, Google Colab is just a hosted Jupyter Notebook service running on Google Cloud. It's very suitable for machine learning and data analysis. Uh, however, there is uh, some limitations due to the free availability. Um, so it's not recommended for really production grade or heavy computational resources. That's uh, time sensitive and uh, dependence uh, because resources are not guaranteed. Uh, there is dynamic usage limits uh, depending on uh, the usage at a period of time. However, it is prioritized really towards people that are creating interactive sessions, uh, just doing uh, small computational models for educational purposes primarily, or uh, simple prototyping, uh, versus uh, if you were to design a long running computational model, it's not very well suited towards that. Uh, you need to go towards more a uh, paid service towards AWS, uh, uh, Google Cloud services or uh, local workstation services, or uh, go towards the paid Colab Pro version, which is also available. The Google Colab uh, GPUs, it offers GPUs in the form of K80, T4, uh, P4S, and the P100. However, they vary over time uh, to meet uh, resource demands. Another resources uh, that could be utilized uh, for free is Google Notebook. It's very similar to Google Colab. Uh, uh, it, it has capabilities to connect with Google Cloud services. It has uh, computational powers of four CPU cores. So you give, each user is given four CPU cores, 16 gigabytes of RAM. 
and uh, GPU specification uh, offers two cores with 13 gigabytes of RAM and the usage limit is uh, six hours runtime uh, with one hour idle and you're allocated 30 hours of GPU per week. Um, we'll go into more of what's offered in Kegel in further uh, sessions, uh, but today we'll kind of see one small component of it in terms of the data sets that we can extract from it. Uh, at any time, uh, anyone has a question, uh, please feel free to let me know um, and um, I can address those questions. Uh, so we can, uh, at this point, we can kind of have a look at our first example. Um, I set up a GitHub repository at this location, https uh, colon backslash backslash github.com. Uh, rail slash deep learning deep uh, dash learning dash workshop underscore uh, into uh, dash to uh, dash NLP. So uh, all the sample codes that we'll be covering today are available there. So if I just jump over towards that URL. Um, so this is the GitHub repository. All the files for today's session is within the folder uh, one, intro to Python, science libraries, and PyTorch. Uh, they're ordered in, they're numbered in the order we'll kind of go through it today. Hi, Alex. Yeah. Um, I don't think your screen switched over to sharing the, the Git repo. Okay, thank you about that. Uh, did it share now? Yeah, I can see it now. Yep. Okay, uh, it's a bit tricky since I have multiple monitors going on right now. So it uh, seems like when I transfer over to a different monitor, it pauses temporarily, but thank you for letting me know. Um, so it's in, this is the main repository and in the folders, the first folder. And the first code that we'll kind of look at together is PyTorch underscore, uh, PyTorch and Colab example. So the very first thing uh, I want to kind of cover is the the co uh, collab site uh, uh, in case with our, regarding it. So to access this, uh, you can just Google collab and it'll bring you, the first link will bring you towards uh, this site. Uh, again, you just need a Google account um, and it's uh, available to, for you for free. So within the uh, this UI, uh, to create a file, uh, to create the Jupyter Notebook, you just have to create file, new notebook, and that generates the notebook for you. At the top um, is the name of the Jupyter Notebook. Uh, you're free to, we can rename that, we can rename that towards uh, specifically the same naming convention as what we had. There we go. Um, so just a couple things regarding the menu options. So within the menu options, uh, you can 
uh, upload a notebook. So if you download the notebook from Jupyter Notebook, you can just uh, upload it via that way. Um, again, so just to update, upload, you would select the file, as well as you can uh, store your files in Google Drive and upload it uh, that way. As well as all these notebooks that you create, they would also be saved in your Google Drive uh, within a Colab folder. So uh, other components that you can do is save uh, the actual Jupyter Notebook. Uh, the, in Colab, these Jupyter Notebooks are auto-save uh, periodically. Uh, however, it's also always good to manually save it yourself, uh, as well as you can download the Jupyter Notebook. Uh, that would be the .ipynp uh, extension file or download it as a Python file, which is in the form of the .py. So with the example that we have, uh, just uh, some basic uh, commands regarding Python. So in Python, uh, to create, uh, generate variables, we just assign a variable name and assign the actual uh, content value that we want to assign it. So in this case, uh, I can assign a variable named text uh, with uh, of type string containing uh, the string sample. As again, we can assign uh, an int to a variable number. And in Python, to print those informations, uh, we use the print command. And, and can perform concatenations. Form concatenation in Pythons, uh, we would need to convert types of uh, int types to strings. Um, another thing we can do is perform text operations to uh, perform multiplication operations to text. So what that would look like is a repetition of uh, the text given the certain noun of numbers. Uh, to define functions in Python, uh, we use the keyword def with the name of the function, and we can assign uh, uh, arguments to it. In this specific case, we'll assign one argument to the function fo, uh, param1. And in Python, uh, things are tabbed eliminated. So uh, to indicate uh, the blocking of code within this function, uh, they are tabbed eliminated. Well, Alex, could you yep. please zoom in just a little bit more? So that when oh, yes. on screen, it's better. Thank, yeah. you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so, again, to uh, escape the, from that method, uh, we remove the tab and we can call the function as we would do in any other language. And um, in Colab, to execute a specific block of code, uh, you just run the uh, play icon just here at the side. Alternatively, you can also click Shift and Enter, and that would do the same thing, as well as uh, move on to the next uh, cell. In this case, it generate a code block cell for us. Um, and 
another component with Python is to import libraries. We just use the keyword import math and uh, to do iterations, uh, we can do four and then a variable name in the range of uh, provided the range that you want to go towards. And that example. Um, so uh, just some basic introductory towards Python for uh, anyone that's new to Python. Those are uh, just some um, basic fundamental things uh, that uh, I wanted to cover before moving on to uh, actually Google Colab. So some neat things regarding Google Colab that might be quite useful is connecting Google Colab towards your Google Drive so that you can uh, place data sets, uh, your data sets in Google Colab and then extract it within um, uh, the col, uh, sorry, you can place your data sets in Google Drive and then access that data set within Colab uh, as well as uh, I'll save your results from Colab to Google Drive. So the first thing I want to show regarding that is just the Google Drive structure. So in my Google Drive structure, um, I configured some components already. I created a Colab data uh, with all my specific information. You can go ahead and remove that. Uh, to kind of cover this example. So the very first thing uh, we want to do is in order to mount uh, your Google Drive to Colab, there are two approaches you can go. The first approach is the manual approach. You can click tools and then go to command palette and search up mount drive. What this will do is uh, bring up pop-up uh, asking permission for access to the Google Drive files. We can connect that and it will mount it. Alternatively, you can do it programmatically. Uh, so the command is from Google dot uh, Colab import drives and we would use the drive.mount command to mount uh, the, the drive. Um, however, we've already done it, so it uh, provides us the message that it's already been mounted. However, if we did not, uh, what will happen is um, it will provide you a link to log in to your Google account, and then it'll give you um, a code, and you would have to enter that code within this uh, dialog box. Um, so, that's, and, uh, so now to actually um, manipulate with uh, the Google folder, what we can do is we can... Hi, Alex. Hi. Hi, could you please go back a little bit, like from Google yep. Cloud? Thank you. Oh, on the Google Colab or uh, no, 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 on the on the notebook when you started okay. coding from the like importing the drive, you yes. know, from there. So if you can just yeah. back up from there, thank you. Okay, so do you, uh, sorry, uh, would you like me to cover this again? Uh, yes. Okay, so let me restart this again. So um, right now. Uh, what you can do for the Google Colab is you can restart to restart it. So it's as if it was a fresh new uh, session. So we do that. Um, and so as I mentioned, uh, to mount the Google Drive account to this Colab session. So uh, for every Colab session that you do, so if you create a Jupyter Notebook, and you want to be able to access content or save content to your Google Drive, uh, you always you would have to always mount the Google Drive for that uh, notebook session. And 
in order to do that, there are two options you can do. The first option is to click Tools, Command Palette, and then type in Mount, and uh, select it, and then it'll give you the option to, uh, it'll ask for permission to connect to your Google Drive. So that's the first option. That's the option that I showed earlier. Um, the second option is if you, uh, uh, if you're going to uh, share it, uh, share your notebook, and you have a, a repository of uh, a repository where you want people to access their own data set, you can do it programmatically to let them know that they should be mounting, uh, and they would have to click here. Oh, sorry. So I have to. So I have to reconnect, reset my whole session. Um, so what is the yeah. point of doing uh, the mounting? Does it provide, does it, this is where the variables get saved when you save anything? No, so the, the, the importance of uh, mounting to your Google Drive is if you want to, so if you're trying to access your own data sets, so you're not loading in a data set from, uh, let's say, Psychic Learn. Let's say you have your own data set that you kind of want to uh, work with. Uh, you can save it in the Google Drive, uh, Google Drive directory. And uh, afterwards, Google Drive directory, and then access it through there, uh, access it through the Colab. So in order to be able to access content in your Google Drive, you have to mount uh, Google Drive, your Google Drive to this session. As well as if you wanna save results to your Google Drive. So uh, do we have to uh, mount the whole drive or we can only mount one, one for example, folder or something like that? Uh, you can mount specific uh, components. Okay. Uh, because okay. in this case, I, 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 mount, I specifically specify that I want to, to mount my whole drive. So okay. it's this little component that you, uh, you would specify here. Okay, sure, thanks. It, yeah. But when you do it manually, it, it will mount your whole drive. Hey, Alec, can I ask you a question? Yep. So uh, I'm thinking like my drive, uh, I've got a lot of stuff in it. Uh, is there like, uh, I, I don't want you to go through the Google permissions uh, tutorial, but I'm thinking, is there a way in this uh, Colab environment to specify which folder we are giving access to so that our sensitive data doesn't get accessed from the Python environment? Um, so what you can do is, well, the thing though is uh, mounting a session, when you mount, it's only for that specific session. So if I were to end this session, this uh, uh, notebook session, I would have to remount all over again. Oh, I understand. So it's, uh, every time you open up, this session, you know, like when you run it, every yeah. time, it's not, it's not specific to the file, it's specific to the, you know, like the tab you open. Yes, right? yes. So, right. uh, so whenever you create uh, this, when you open up this, uh, this notebook, um, it, it, Google will create a new session for you. Thank you, thank you. Can I add something? Yes. And perhaps if you uh, add another forward slash, like for now we're using content slash drive, and if, if you create another directory, you're able to mount that specific directory. Yes. So uh, it will create another layer of security somehow. Yes. Thank you, Ernest. Thank you. Uh, so uh, to the, does anybody else have any questions regarding? Uh, the mounting component of it. Uh, okay. So uh, one question that is in the chat is that when you're calling a data set, do you have to specify the file extension? 
Uh, yes, you do. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll kind of see an example of that uh, uh, in a later example. In a later example, we'll kind of look at uh, downloading a data set from Kaggle, storing it in our Google Drive, and then accessing it through our Google Drive. Uh, so just in a quick example here, so in order to create files and uh, create directories within the Google Drive, what we can do is regular commands in Python. So right now, uh, I have this folder already. Um, I can go ahead and remove it just to show it for demonstration purposes. So if I do... Oh, sorry. So um, it gave me the error that the file existed because uh, it didn't re register quite yet that I deleted it. Um, so I have executed that command. Um, a good way to know if you actually executed your uh, collab command is these numbers of the execution of uh, the numbers are incremental. So this was the first uh, command that I executed. And I executed this command twice, so that's why the indexing is three and this one is one. Uh, okay, so um, just to continue uh, where we left off. Uh, so the last portion was I was able to generate um, the folder collab data within my directory. And we have collab data, which is empty. And Sorry to interrupt you, Alex. If you could yep. zoom in a little bit again as well. Oh. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry about that. Sorry. There you go. Is that a lot better or should I zoom in a bit more? I think it's perfect. Okay. Okay. So, uh, sorry, just give me one second. Just having to bring up all my. Components again. Uh, so, another thing I want to demonstrate that's in the code within the sample is uh, you can generate, uh, you can perform terminal commands by using um, magic commands, uh, which is um, indicated by the percent sign uh, with the actual terminal command. So if you want to navigate towards uh, specifically uh, a folder, uh, you can use the cd command and then make dirs from there to change the present working directory. Um, and again, uh, we can kind of illustrate that that way. Um, and then the last component is, uh, again, to just generate any files. Uh, it's just a regular Python syntax where we would have to open a file in write mode and execute the write command. And that will generate and write the command. So this is very uh, useful in uh, once we start actually going towards the machine learning component and we want to save some of our, our logs, our reportings of our results. Any questions so far regarding the linking of Colab and the driver? Uh, okay, so just to move on towards the slides. 
so a couple of libraries uh, that I wanted to highlight is uh, in, within Python that's very useful. Uh, the first being a scikit-learn. It's a general toolkit for predictive data analysis. It has many analysis for classification, regressions, uh, clustering. Uh, clustering and uh, for the pandas, uh, we look at the toolkit for data frame and uh, structure and data manipulations. We also have the component for NumPy, which is support for large multi-dimensional arrays and matrices. And then we also have uh, SciPy toolkit for scientific computing, such as numerical integration, uh, interpolation, optimization, linear algebra, and statistics. And then some NLP libraries that we'll kind of cover throughout this workshop. Um, some, uh, the first being NLTL, uh, NLTK. Uh, it's, I would say, is the most commonly used library for natural language processing in Python. Uh, another uh, popular one is Core NLP. It has less supported features than NLTK. Um, however, it provide the, the features that it does support uh, uh, typically operate faster than NLTK. We have Gensum, which is specialized in identifying semantic similarities. Um, and it's also good because it supports a, a large corpora. Uh, another component that's commonly used is SpySci. So it's for fast synthetic parser, um, but the one limitation is its language support. However, if you do need parsers within one of those supported language, it's highly efficient. Uh, another one is pattern, which uh, supports uh, some common uh, NLP tasks such as part of speech tagging, sentiment analysis, vector modeling, SVM, clustering, ngram search, as well as WordNet. Uh, WordNet is just a bank of uh, suitable words, uh, specifically for nouns, verbs, uh, adjectives. Um, and uh, text uh, blob, it's very good for beginners because it provides an easy interface for some basic NLP tasks. Um, so next example that we'll be covering is the pandas and psychic learn. So in that example, I'm going to kind of uh, illustrate how we can load it from the Google Drive uh, with uh, sorry with uh, from the GitHub repository. So, if you download from the GitHub repository, what you can do is bring it up, right click on the raw and save link as. What that will do is save the raw version as the Python version, uh, as the Jupyter Notebook. So, Hi, Alex. Um, you're not sharing the screen anymore. Oh, sorry. The, the other screen. Yeah, it's still the presentation. Still the presentation. Uh, thank you about that. Uh, so, given that um, if you navigate to the GitHub repository, you can download the, uh, the Jupyter Notebook by uh, viewing uh, the actual Jupyter Notebook, right-clicking the raw and saving the link as, um, and then you can save the link as uh, something. And then once you have that, uh, you can move it over towards a uh, Jupyter Notebook. So in your, sorry, in your drive, uh, Jupyter Notebook has uh, this folder that uh, puts all your notebooks together. So I actually already have it here and I called it toy example. Uh, 
Um, so uh, given the shortage of time, I'll kind of explain uh, through what each is, uh, kind of walk through it um, and then uh, you can kind of go over it on, on yourself. All the code is there on GitHub repository. So the first uh, set of block of code is uh, performing all the necessary inputs. And in this specific case, we kind of go through an example of pandas of we're testing out um, uh, the iris data set. The iris data set um, is a simple data set that tries to classify uh, specific irises by their type. There's three types. Um, and it, there's only four features here, which is, uh, we'll kind of see it actually. I don't have the features remember at the top of the head, so I have to run it. Uh, learn, which is Sky Learn dataset. Um, and then it loads it as a panda data frame and uh, just displays the top uh, five, uh, the, the first top uh, entries, data points. Uh, given the data frame, you can also gain um, some useful information such as the size. Uh, a summary of each column. So in this case, a uh, very uh, useful tool when you're dealing with uh, tab delimited data or common delimited data is perhaps maybe trying to identify any missing data within your data set. Um, so you can use the df.info for that. Um, and in this case, uh, we have no missing data in this data point. Uh, indicated by the fact that there's 150 entries for the sepal length we have 150 non null and, and uh, null non null entries. so all of them have 150 entries in them uh, another useful thing is the describe uh, which provides some uh, basic statistical information regarding each column so it gives us the count the mean the standard deviation the mean value for that column, uh, the 25% uh, uh, point, the 50%, 75%, and the max. Uh, you can also perform aggregation. So in this case, if I want to determine the mean information based off the labels, so in this case, based off the classification, um, you can group by the actual label and then output its specific statistical information. In this case, um, I'm interested in the mean. Uh, you can also generate a uh, plot, in this case, a uh, histogram plot. So provides us some information regarding the sepal length and how it's being distributed with that. And um, we can also generate a histogram uh, based off the classification type with different colors. That's what this cell does. Uh, and this one, uh, we can kind of look at, at it from the scatter plot perspective. So uh, this is very useful in, in, when you're dealing with, uh, when you're doing some initial investigation work where um, just looking at this scatter plot right away, I can kind of see some uh, clear, uh, DV, uh, uh, clear indication of some clustering. So in this case, I have a cluster uh, within this area where it looks like it's for classification type zero. Um, so based off of uh, just in this case, I am looking at the sepal length and the sepal width. It seems like just with those two features, I'm able to distinguish between a, uh, the, this classification that's in a dark blue compared to the other classification. So that's a good, two, uh, two strong features uh, to distinguish just that uh, specific class. 
Um, we can also do it with uh, rat dev. So with rat dev, we look at it's similar to a scatter plot, but we're using all the features in multi dimensions. Uh, again, we can kind of see the clustering of that zero uh, zero class. Uh, now looking at uh, Psychic Learn, uh, this uh, bottom section looks at the Psychic Learn component, uh, where we're actually going to do the same thing and generate a scatter plot, very similar to what we did with Pandas. Uh, but what's nice with uh, Psychic Learn is it has some built-in uh, machine learning algorithms. In this specific case, um, we can easily do PCA on, specifically we are looking at the sepal length and sepal width, because we kind of, we saw some indication of some separation between one classification. If we take those two features and conduct a PCA, uh, we can kind of see a better, represent, uh, better separation between the other two classes that's are remaining. Uh, so I know I kind of covered that very quickly, but are there any questions regarding uh, Pandas and Psychic Learn? No. Okay. Uh, so just to quickly move on. So uh, now with PyTorch. So PyTorch. Um, so with PyTorch, we have, uh, so what PyTorch is, is a machine learning framework. Uh, it it's, uh, performs tensor computations and it's developed by Facebook. What's great with PyTorch is it provides automatic differentiation. So uh, a very key component towards deep learning and neural networks is the backpropagation. Uh, with automatic differentiation, uh, we don't actually need to calculate uh, to calculate the backpropagation. That is automatically calculated based off of uh, the coding runtime. So the two examples that I kind of want to go through is the uh, PyTorch example and the Link Tango example. So these are the last two examples. So if we go back here. Um, Alex, we have one question yeah. that is, uh, what makes PyTorch different from TensorFlow? Um, so the main difference right now is there's not much difference anymore uh, because with TensorFlow 2.0, uh, their comp computational graphs can also be generated dynamically, uh, where before uh, that was the selling point of PyTorch where uh, the computational graphs would have to be, would, are generated dynamically uh, as uh, during execution time. Where in uh, TensorFlow, the computational graphs would have to be generated during compilation. Um, so all the, the necessary components uh, would be, uh, the full layout of the model would need to be generated. Uh, primarily, I see TensorFlow used primarily more uh, within the industry with production grade, uh, primarily uh, where primarily because TensorFlow has been out longer, where I find PyTorch is primarily used within the research field uh, because of its ease of prototyping. Uh, however, uh, we're kind of seeing a blend uh, as TensorFlow and PyTorch are become as they're being upgraded. Uh, they're kind of becoming more in line with each other. Uh, so um, the example that we have here is uh, 
simple PyTorch example uh, where we create a multi-layer perceptron. Um, again, in this example, we are uh, using the iris data set. So uh, again, we do our imports, um, what we commonly do. And so how does, how is the Keras different from the other two? Uh, so Keras is actually a higher level framework than uh, PyTorch and TensorFlow. Uh, Keras will sit on top of PyTorch or TensorFlow. Uh, Keras as a backend uses PyTorch or TensorFlow un underneath. Uh, uh, Keras is uh, a little bit more high overview. Uh, it's a lot easier, I find it's a lot easier to generate very simple models. However, once you start going towards more customization towards your architecture and custom loss functions or custom activation functions, uh, then that's where Keras kind of falls behind. Um, but it's a very good platform for high overview programming for machine, uh, for deep learning and machine learning. So, um, uh, again, Keras, um, you actually, when you code in Keras, you actually have, you specify uh, if it's using PyTorch or TensorFlow on the back end. So, in this uh, block of code, uh, we generate, uh, uh, we prepare our data sets. Um, another one thing I wanted to highlight regarding here is uh, to create a training and test split of the data sets. Uh, we can utilize this uh, again, Psychic Learn uh, package, which has the train test split. And all you have to do is specify uh, the first parameter is the features, second one is the labels. Um, we specify a random state as well as a shuffle. Uh, if we want to shuffle or not, shuffle the data set. And that generates uh, four outputs, uh, first being the, the features split up into train and test and the labels split up into train and test. Uh, to define your actual models in PyTorch, you have to create a class that inherits from the module uh, and, and module. And two key components that's required um, is the initialization and the forward function when you're defining any, um, multi, uh, any model in PyTorch. Um, within the initialization, it always starts off with the super command to initialize based off uh, the inherited model, uh, module uh, class. And then uh, within the initialization, you specify the layers. Uh, the, the structure of your model. So in this case, we specify three layers, all linear layers uh, with a varying number of hidden layers. So the first one is the first diameter for the uh, parameter for the linear component is the input dimension as well as the output dimension. Now, um, uh, there is, so in this case, we have three layers, the first being containing 50 neurons, 20 neurons, and three neurons. We have the last layer containing three neurons uh, because our class, we, our data set is um, three, a multi-layer, a multi-classification of with uh, three varying uh, labels. The forward of method defines how the forward pass of the neural network works. So in this case, it defines, uh, we define it as uh, the input going towards the first neural layer uh, that gets uh, with an activation function, with a ReLU activation function uh, that generates that first uh, output. Uh, the next uh, forward uh, component that it must go through is the second layer and again, a relief activation. 
the the last component, uh, the last forward component that it goes through in the network is uh, the the last uh, hidden layer with a soft max activation. Uh, so there's that component. Um, another thing I wanted to highlight here. is so when you start off a uh, collab notebook it is not by default going to enable gpu uh and enable gpu for you uh, to do that you would have to go to edit notebook settings and uh oh, i already had it set from prior before uh so it's already set so uh to have uh, gpu capabilities for the notebook you would have to go to the notebook settings and set GPU or TPU. So in this case, since our process isn't too extensive, we can just select GPU. And again, this will, there is a couple things uh, that is available in Torch to determine if you are using um, GPU or not GPU. Uh, so there's can a question. Regarding sorry. Yeah, sorry, can you, you can ask your question first. I was just wondering how, how you got to the, the menu where you could choose GPU. Oh, so you just go to edit um, notebook settings. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So for, there was a question on the, on the chat for when to use a dimension of one in a softmax function. So if you're, if, if you're, you, you would never really use a dimension one in a softmax function, uh, primarily because if you're in a dimension of one, that would mean your classification is binary. And if your classification is binary, then in most cases, we'll just use a sigmoid activation uh, to determine for binary cases, uh, because sigmoid will force uh, the output to be ze uh, uh, zero to uh, zero or one force it in the, towards those directions. Uh, and uh, this next component is defining uh, our training for the model. So the type of optimization we use, as well as the loss function. So in this case, it's just a simple cross anthropy loss function. And this last component is really just the training component. So things to note for when you train it is very uh, straightforward in PyTorch. You just feed in your input to your model that generates the forward pass of the predictions. And then you, you feed in your, you're feeding your prediction as well as your true value to your loss function to generate the loss, okay? And then what you do then is you have to set the optimizer to zero grade to reset uh, the gradients. Uh, back to zero and then perform a uh, loss that uh, backward prop backward and that will do is calculate all the gradients for your weights um, and then optimizer.step that will update your weights uh, any questions regarding uh, pytorch um so this example was just um classification example in pytorch with the two layer neural network um, two layer hidden layers and uh, one layer for the output. Mm -hmm. So yes. Okay. Yeah. yes. So that's the example here. Um, there is one more example uh, given shortness of time. Do we have to transfer the model to GPU? Uh, yes. So uh, to tra there, you do have to transfer the model to the GPU as well as uh, the, the input variables to the GPU. So that's where this line of code happens. So um, right here, model two, and then the current device. The current device uh, determines what device we're actually using. That's the uh, current device. Um, if you do CUDA uh, dot get device, uh, CUDA dot get current device, that will actually return you the mo more optimal a device. So if you do have GPU, that will return your GPU. If you don't have GPU, that will return your CPU. Um, so you have to transfer your model as well as your uh, variables 
in terms of your input as well as your outputs because everything's working on the GPU when it's calculating the forward pass as well as the loss function and the backwards propagation. Um, I have one quick question. So in the yeah. Google Colab, we don't have anything like a workspace that allows us to see what variables have been built and outputs like that, right? I know. No. And how do you, yeah, how do you save uh, the, let's say if you let this run and you wanted to save the parameters later on, you have to have an extra line of code to save anything you want to save? Um, yeah, so I have been saving models uh, and trans, uh, transfer learning from the models. Uh, we'll kind of cover that um, as we go more into uh, okay, deep great. dive and more into deep learning. Uh, probably uh, we'll, we'll look into that probably in session uh, two or session three. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Um, so the GPU gain for very small models, um, again, uh, it, it depends. It depends. Uh, there might be some small gain if you have a very large data set um, and you, you, you want to process very, very large batches. Uh, you might gain some uh, aspects of that. However, uh, the gain is really coming to when you have uh, highly complex models like Inceptions or BERT, uh, or, or, um, and those are multi-layer uh, deep learning models with multiple weights to learn. Um, we, we often don't need to use uh, GPUs for uh, very toy examples. Uh, the last thing I'm going to quickly cover is linking of uh, the color. Actually, given the shortness of time, um, we can actually cover this component um, in the next session. Uh, this will go towards uh, uh, a Kaggle and downloading uh, data sets there. Um, so given the, the shortness of time, uh, I'll move that over to the next session. Um, and uh, just to do some close, some last remarks for uh, potential local uh, aspects of workstations, uh, things to consider when you are looking towards uh, uh, more resources than Google Colab or uh, the Kaggle notebooks can offer and looking at uh, creating your own local workstations. Uh, some things to really look at for GPU is to ensure that you're actually using a, a GPU that's compat that is CUDA enabled. Um, I provided, there's uh, a resources by NVIDIA that provides a list of all uh, graphics cards that are CUDA Kuba enabled. And the other component to really look at is the management of environments. The good things about using uh, Kaggle notebooks and Collapse, uh, those environments have been already uh, set up pri primarily for data science and machine learning. So those packages have been, uh, those environments have been configured with the necessary, the common packages that I mentioned. Uh, but if you're working on a local machine, uh, management and environments can work on uh, three components, uh, I would say is uh, three common components, which is Anaconda, VM, and local environments. Uh, the rec I would recommend the Anaconda uh, just because you have um, multiple virtual environments managed that you can do. And a lot of the uh, uh, packages and libraries available in uh, Anaconda are data science and machine learning. Uh, so there's that, that component as well, as well as uh, when you're working with uh, multiple data science and machine learning projects, uh, certain packages, uh, you, oftentimes you're not working with uh, one set of packages, you're using a different set of packages. And if you're using some set of packages, uh, they might require different dependencies of different versions from another package. Um, so uh, it's very good to have 
uh, various uh, virtual environments for individual projects. Um, you can also use uh, VM, uh, which is default by Python, and do installations using pip. Or the last option is local environment, but how I mentioned the downside with uh, creating or uh, managing just one single environment within your local environment is when you have various projects with different package dependencies. Um, so that's all uh, for the, today's session. Um, again, we apologize for the disruption. Uh, we'll resolve those minor uh, issues um, in the following sessions. Uh, does anybody have any questions within closing? Uh, I, uh, some students have expressed if um, the, your uh, PPTs, your PowerPoint presentations will be uploaded somewhere or sent via email to them. Uh, yeah, so I'll share it with uh, uh, Yunus, uh, uh, which uh, the, mm -hmm. he, he can distribute to yeah. the people that register. Yeah. Thank you all again, and sorry for the interruption. I will provide the presentation as well as the clean version of the presentation together to the people who have registered. Yeah, uh, also, um, just um, I'll also be sharing uh, a Google form uh, if everybody could uh, fill that out, uh, just so um, we can ma make some improvements for the next session as well. Yeah, I'll show them all yeah. together to the end. Yes. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. It was great. Thank you. See you all, and hopefully, hope to see you next week for the second session. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. All. A quick question, Alex. Yeah. Um, could I ask a question about training, but more around computer vision? Uh, sure. So um, more about setting up the training when you have, let's say, for automatic segmentation. Okay. Um, so now is it just comes down to how you sort both your masks and then your frames and then just simply inserting it into the model fit, dot fit? So, so, uh, so, uh, you're doing a segmentation task, correct? Yes. Um, where you you want your your model to do the seg automatically do the segmentation, correct? Right. Uh, so, uh, there's different approaches to it depending on again the type of model that you use uh, because it'll depend. Uh, the input is most like is going to be in most cases um, the, the, the raw image. And it's really the output that might change depending on the type of architecture that you're using uh, where you, there are models depending on, again, how it's being, uh, the granularity of your segmentation where uh, you can have your outputs as the same dimension as your input. However, right. each, each, each output is a binary uh, a sigmoid output where you're determining if this is uh, pixel is area of interest or not area of interest. If, I'm not sure did that answer your question or not. Uh, yeah, it does. Okay, yeah, that's one approach. Again, uh, there's different approaches as well. Uh, uh, it, it really depends on the architecture of your model, uh, how it's kind of formulated. But that's the most uh, straightforward approach. Okay, thank you. Um, there are... It also, another area of interest you might look for, there are packages that do segment, uh, that are very good for segmentation. Um, I don't know what type of segmentations you are in, uh, but uh, in the medical field, there are some good um, segmentation tools already, depending on the, bot, uh, the type of segmentation you're looking at. Yeah, I was, um, I was thinking more something novel um, based on this literature. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. But yeah, just, I guess, setting it up for training and uh, having, especially if it's like scans, there's many um, images that you have to go through for like one case. But um, 
Yep, I'll try figuring that out. Yeah, so uh, just curious, are you working off of a three-dimensional uh, volume images? Uh, volume? I am, but as of now, I'm applying a 2D, um, uh, 2D yeah, architecture, the, but um, might transition it to a 3D. Uh, yeah, there are quite a bit of work. The primary prominent uh, area that I see in that research is uh, looking at it from a two-dimensional approach, but then um, you do a stacking kind of layer where uh, the problem though with that is you kind of lose information, uh, neighboring information from that uh, higher volume. So there are some mm -hmm. works that kind of expands a little bit, but not too much because the problem that you have when you're working with uh, three-dimensional volumes within computer image is the, the dimensionality of that image. And when you come to neural networks, then um, a, in some, if you have the computation of, it might be uh, the size of the, the network can become exponentially large once you start getting into those uh, three dimensional inputs volumes. Mm -hmm. So again, it, it really depends on the resolution. Uh, okay. Of that point. Okay. Also, um, if I have any follow-up questions, is there somewhere else I can reach you by? Uh, yeah. So I will share. Uh, I'll share my contact information uh, with Eunice, and he he'll send it in that one email that he'll with all the Great. material. Sure. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Um, anybody else with last-minute questions? I think we're good, Eunice. I'll just send you those uh, information, Eunice. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, again. And see you all next week. Okay. See you. Bye.